I'm Ellen Puree from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I'm the Grace Lansing Lampert Professor and Chair of Biomedical Sciences at the School of Veterinary Medicine and a Professor of Systems Pharmacology and Therapeutics at the School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. There are several major issues when it comes to the important T cell response. These are T cells that can kill tumor cells um, in the context of cancer. And one of the most important questions at the moment is, can we convert the successes we've had in activating immune T cells and or adoptively transferring in, genetically engineered T cells, such as CAR T cells, um, into patients and get them to both traffic to tumors and to function, be functional in those tumors with, and be effective killers in, in the tumor setting. We've seen this work very successfully in hematologic tumors, but have had considerably less success so far in solid tumors. I think today's sessions, we've heard lots of data about advances that are relevant to overcoming this barrier in solid tumors. The first point would be the trafficking itself, and we heard some talks about how we can modify the tumor microenvironment in a way that will allow T cells to actually traffic into tumors, access the tumor cells, as well as be functional. That is really an advance over what we've seen to date. The other, though, is that in most tumors, even if T cells do arrive, whether they're from the patient themselves or adoptively transferred CAR T cells, is that those cells get there, but even if they get there, they're hypofunctional or suppressed. Their immune activity is markedly suppressed. And so they're not effective in any way, and they're just there, but not doing their job. So what we really got learned a lot about today is the mechanisms by which the T cells are rendered dysfunctional. And what we learned is that there are many, many factors that contribute to this dysfunctional state. One is category are intrinsic factors within the T cells themselves. So we heard from several people about chromatin remodeling, we learned about transcriptional programs, and we learned about post-translational um, regulation of expression of the proteins and factors that T cells need to make or genes that they need to express in order to be functional. So those are the T cell intrinsic factors. We also learned that there's a lot of extrinsic factors that play a critical role. So what do I mean by that? Well one is that there are tumor derived factors but also other immune cells like immune suppressive myeloid cells um, which we also heard quite a bit about today, and their ability to make factors that will suppress the function of T cells. Cancer-associated fibroblasts do the same, and we heard quite a bit about that. But we also heard some other very interesting talks, for example, about the role of stress, which results in the release of glucocorticoids, which can also cause dysfunction in T cells or inhibit their function in novel ways. Another really interesting um, topic that came up is the fact that the tumor antigens themselves that these T cells respond to, known as neoantigens, are one of the chronic stimulators of these cells. But unfortunately, chronic stimulation, as we heard, can lead to activation of some of the intrinsic pathways that I mentioned that then turn the T cells off. So again, really complex crosstalk or network of communications between tumor cells, other immune and inflammatory cells, cancer-associated fibroblasts, myeloid cells, polymorphonuclear cells, or um, neutrophils as we call them, all have mechanisms that can inhibit T cell function. So why is it important that we learn about those mechanisms? Well, ideally, by understanding those mechanisms, we can interfere with them and we can reverse their activities. And that would be, of course, a way to enhance T cell activity and enhance, therefore, immunotherapies. 
One problem with that, however, is, and we just don't know yet because all of this is coming at us very fast this week, but if there are so many mechanisms, if you knock out one, will another become even more active and overcome the benefits of knocking that particular pathway out? So we have a lot to learn about how redundant, how critical certain mechanisms are versus others, and whether they act in concert or not, so that we understand what are the molecular pathways that we are, are being revealed need to be tackled and in what combination. So that's something for the future. One additional thing I'd like to comment on is that it's really interesting to think about are all these mechanisms transient, are they reversible, um, and can we in any way enforce a anti-tumorigenic function of T-cells as opposed to a pro-tumorigenic or at least a dysfunctional lack of activity against tumor. Um, so a couple of things we learned here today about that. One is that there is some plasticity and reversibility, um, so that's the good news, but there also appears to be at some stage a epigenetic mechanism that actually stabilizes the new phenotype and that would in fact be present quite a barrier to trying to reverse that response of the dysfunctional T cell and making them work properly again. So there are still those challenges to understand and especially in the context of tumors, we now know that epigenetics plays a big role and that can truly stabilize a new phenotype of the T cells. The other thing I would mention is that we always think that cancer is a bit of a unique system um, we have mutations and we have cancer and they're different. They're not like normal individuals, uh, cells in normal individuals. But actually one of the things we know from, from history now, but also was really highlighted today, is that dysfunction of T cells is not unique to cancer. It's in fact intrinsically important to things like autoimmune disease and infection. So chronic infection, just like in cancer, there's chronic stimulation of the T cells, and that can lead to their dysfunction. And what we learned today is that both in autoimmunity and in chronic infections, the mechanisms invoked by the T cells, both intrinsic and extrinsic factors, can actually mimic or be very highly related to those that we're seeing in chronic infection and autoimmunity. So there's an importance for crosstalk between these fields where sharing that knowledge will help us advance our knowledge of T-cell dysfunction in cancer as well. Perfect. So like all the other uh, compartments of the solid tumor, solid tumors are like, the, are basically new organs that form. And they form around the tumor itself but it involves both resident cells and cells newly recruited from circulation or bone marrow, for example, to give rise to what looks like a whole new organ. Um, and within that response, one of the most activated uh, compartments is the myeloid compartment. And that's very typical. Most stress responses, and cancer causes a stress response, activates bone marrow to try to respond to the stress and protect. And in do so doing, however, it gets over enthusiastic in a way and will pour out cells that are less mature than the typical cell that comes out. And they'll traffic to the tumor, they'll take up residence there, and they'll misbehave. They behave just like the T cells. They become somewhat dysfunctional. And so they get their activity gets usurped by the tumor to help the tumor rather than to destroy the tumor. And that adaptation is due to this very intricate communications between the tumor cells, the myeloid cells themselves, but also indirectly through other cell types that are like the T cells and the uh, stromal cells or cancer-associated fibroblasts. Changes in the matrix that are um, made by the remodeling of matrix by things like macrophages and cancer-associated fibroblasts. All of these things then regulate the myeloid cell and vice versa. And what we really learn, like every other cell type, that these myeloid cells are extremely heterogeneous. And that is a challenge. 
So we learn that some of the subsets are good for tumors and others are bad for tumors, but good for the patient because they can destroy tumor. And what we really saw today is that technology and further studies are really revealing to us that heterogeneity. It's even more complicated because that heterogeneity is also plastic. So a macrophage or a myeloid cell can take on a phenotype that can easily change to another phenotype based on their surroundings, um, including tumor derived factors and so on. So it's quite complex. It, in, it, it involves multiple networks of communication between all the compartments, and we have to deal with the heterogeneity and the fact that even if you target a particular type of myeloid cell that's bad, it can try to escape by turning sort of like a chameleon and change its colors and become someone else. Um, and as a, a so it's an additional challenge to us, the heterogeneity and complexity that was revealed. But as we deconstruct that and understand the molecular mechanisms in those myeloid cells, both intrinsic and extrinsic, and we catch up to where we now are in the T-cell heterogeneity and changes in T-cells and understanding the molecular mechanisms of their dysfunctionality, then we'll perhaps catch up in the myeloid system and be able to, again, understand which pathways that might provide vulnerabilities to uh, therapeutic intervention. For me, I think the things in general that I think I saw the greatest advances in and are the, therefore my takeaways, one is that the advances in technology and also in informatics um, is really just escalating our knowledge advances um, almost in inconceivable ways. The amount of data that we get, but the ways we can now, for a long time that was almost just daunting because how does one manage that data? How does one interpret that data? We are now coming up with ways to do that. And it really is making us, clarifying for us what the landscape in this very complex micro, uh, tumor environment is and understanding each cell, not just each kind of cell, of which there are hundreds of thousands, but literally down to the single cell level, understanding what complexity there is and what are the sort of takeaway lessons we can learn about what the function of the cells, all the cells, every single cell in that environment is. But also we're learning that there's such an important um, factor is the spatial relationships and the structure of the organ that we form in the tumor. So we're really learning both at the single cell level about the cell biology, but also an enormous amount about the biophysics of cancer and the spatial relationships and heterogeneity and the temporal relationships and heterogeneity. And I think that all has been advanced largely by advances in technology that go hand in hand. So that's first. Second would be that there really has been for some time now, with not a lot of positive reinforcement, the idea that we're so excited about how well immunotherapy has worked, but that has been restricted for the most part to hematologic tumors, as I said earlier. And I think what was truly exciting today is that we're starting to see glimmers of positive responses and under, uh, in solid tumors, which are, is a very big area to tackle everything from prostate to breast cancer, to colon cancer, to pancreatic cancer, all of which are, affect so many, many, many people with not as many options yet of successful therapy, at least in the fourth pillar of therapy, which is now immunology. And just as an aside, I will say that. I think 10 years ago, and especially 20 years ago, Immunology and cancer was not really bought into by a lot of people. The Cancer Research Institute, the AACR, et cetera, have really supported us to make this clear to everyone that the immune system is important in cancer, and perhaps most importantly, that it can be used to attack cancer. And not only is it now accepted, but it's actually considered the fourth pillar of cancer care. We heard that over and over today. It is the fourth pillar after medical intervention, surgical and radiation oncology. It is now 
accepted to be the fourth and rapidly advancing to be at the forefront of cancer therapies. The last two points I would make is how much we've learned about the dysfunction of the immune system. And it's important to understand it to overcome its dysfunction. And today just really demonstrated how far we've come and at such great resolution and detail that you can imagine many of those pathways being described here today, becoming targets for new therapies within the next years to decade. Um, and that's a very exciting idea, that we will be able to overcome some of the resistance to immunotherapy. And finally, what I would say is that no therapy comes without toxicity. Drugs are drugs, no matter they're living drugs, they're immune-mediated drugs, we are going to see side effects, adverse side effects. So what do we do about that? Well, we've seen them. The most common is not surprising with immunotherapy. We reduce the inhibition of the immune system. And so not only the tumor-directed immune response, but some of the immune response to our normal organs, which are kept suppressed, now become unleashed. And we see some autoimmune sequelae. Those have been dealt with quite well, and we've been dealing with them for years. But we're now seeing additional toxicities, such as neural toxicities, cognitive effects. And what we learned today is that we are also beginning to understand the mechanisms underlying those toxic these new, uh, newly understood toxicities. And that again gives us the opportunity to prevent them and or to treat them. So I, the last point I would make for today is that we are really taking seriously the impact of immunotherapy. We understand it's now the fourth pillar. We have to deal with the consequences as well, and we're doing so at a mechanistic level so that we can overcome those adverse events.